Okay, so where did we end last week? Last week we ended with the Pettis measurability theorem. And I'm gonna remind you what that is. We have a, a measurable space. So a set S and a sigma algebra A. So measurable space and a Barnack space X. Then a function valued in X is strongly measurable. Recall that this means that your function is a, a pointwise limit of simple functions. So your function F is strongly measurable if and only if it is weakly measurable. So that means that all of these kind of coordinate functions where you test F against a functional, these are all measurable. So measurable for all functionals X star in the dual. And furthermore, you need to have that F is separably valued. Meaning that F maps S into some separable subspace of X. Of course, if X is separable, then what this says is strong measurability is the same as weak measurability, which is the same as measurability in the classical sense. So for separable Barnack spaces, you only really have the one notion of measurability. But in general, you've got three. Strong measurability, measurability, and weak measurability. Now, so we proved that. We sort of proved that. There were some mistakes in the proof that we were discussing before the lecture started, and this is easy enough to fix. And I've, I've corrected this in the notes, but I haven't uploaded the new notes yet. Okay, so let's move on to some actual content. I promised some corollaries of the Pettis theorem where I'd show that some functions are strongly measurable that are maybe not obviously strongly measurable. And I've claimed that this is an incredibly useful theorem, so I need to back that up. Let's look at a corollary. If you take a strongly measurable function f, you're going to abbreviate strongly measurable with sm. So if f is strongly measurable, and you take a function phi mapping into the scalar field, which is just measurable. This is a scalar valid function, so you only have one notion of measurability. Then the, the pointwise product phi f is also strongly measurable. This pointwise product is defined in the usual way. Now, one way you can show this is to approximate f by simple functions and to approximate phi by simple functions and to use that to create simple approximants to phi f, but that's a terribly boring thing to do. It's a bit easier if you use the Pettis theorem. And it's not too hard. You need to show that phi f is weakly measurable. And to show this, you just compute what happens when you test phi f against a functional. So I should say for all x star in the dual of x. So this function is just phi of s, f of s tested against x star. And you can take this scalar phi of s out of the dual pairing. And now you see that this is a product of a measurable function because F is assumed to be, well, F is strongly measurable. So by Pettis, or even without using Pettis, F is weakly measurable. So this scalar function here is measurable and phi is also measurable by assumption. So this function phi F tested against X star is measurable. And this shows that phi f is weakly measurable because these scalar valued functions are measurable for all functionals x star. You also need to show that phi f is separably valued. Well, 
f is separably valued by Pettis. So there exists a separable subspace x prime of x such that f maps s into x prime. And then you have the phi f of s equals phi of s f of s. And this has to be in x prime for all s in the space because f of s is in there and phi of s is just a scalar. And subspaces are of course preserved by scalar multiplication. And that's your proof. You don't have to deal with simple functions. So this is much nicer. You can just directly test weak measurability and separable valuedness. You can just extract this from F and use that phi is just scalar valued and everything just works. You might want to go and write up the proof using simple functions, but it's not interesting. More interesting to just use the Pettis theorem. So that's a nice simple corollary. We're going to use that implicitly all the time because you will, when you're defining the Fourier transform, for example, you take a vector valued function and you multiply it by a complex exponential. That's a scalar valued measurable function. And you like to know that this multiplication you defined is strongly measurable so that you can integrate it. We'll see later on how to integrate strongly measurable functions. So let's move on to another result. Actually, before I talk about the result, we're going to move to measure spaces now. Finally, we've been dealing with measurable spaces all of this time, sets with sigma algebras. Now we're going to put measures on them. So let's consider a measure space. So we have a measurable space and we have a measure that I'll usually call mu. I'm going to introduce a convention that we're going to assume throughout the course and measure theorists and maybe probabilists are going to get angry at me, but every measure space is sigma finite. This is an assumption, right? Not every measure space is sigma finite. Uh, sigma finite, of course, means that you can cover your space with a countable collection of sets of finite measure, which means you can usually you can usually reduce your results to results for finite measure spaces and then just bootstrap them up to sigma finite. Most of the results I'm going to do in this course also work for non sigma finite measure spaces, but you get these extra technicalities and some of these have to do with strong measurability and notions of almost everywhere strong measurability. And so that I don't have to think about all of these technicalities, I'm just going to restrict to sigma finite measure spaces. Every application we have is going to be on R or RN or something like that, which is of course sigma finite. So or on probability spaces, which are tautologically sigma finite because they're finite. right? So given this, given a measure space, if we have two functions, f and g, mapping into a Banach space x, we say that f is almost everywhere equal to g, written using this notation, which is not completely standard. If the set of points where f is not equal to g has measure zero. the standard notion of almost everywhere equality. Really, I just wanted to introduce this notation, AE equals. Now we're gonna be dealing with almost everywhere equality of functions pretty much all the time and pretty much implicitly. And the way that this interacts with strong measurability that I want to explain is in the following lemma, which is another application of the Pettis theorem. Everything really is an application of the Pettis theorem. In short, it just says that almost everywhere equality is equivalent to weak almost everywhere equality. You can probably guess the statement of the lemma from this statement here, if you know what I mean by weak x. It's the, the version of property x that comes from testing against every functional in the dual space. So suppose f and g are vector valued functions that are strongly measurable. 
I'm pretty sure this result fails if you don't assume strong measurability, but I don't have a counter example on the top of my head. So maybe you can figure that out. If F and G are strongly measurable, then F is almost everywhere equal to G if and only if for all functionals in the dual space that are non-zero. Actually, you don't have to assume non-zero here. You have that this functional, this scalar valued function that you get by testing against a functional X star is almost everywhere equal to the same one for to this scalar valued function associated with G. So this is almost everywhere equality. And this is weak almost everywhere equality. So this is a property of scalar valued functions on the right here. So this lets you check a quality of vector valued functions by reducing to a quality of scalar valued functions. And this is really useful because it lets you take identities for scalar valued functions and then just in one step conclude them for the corresponding vector valued functions. If you've got vector valued functions that are somehow constructed out of scalar ones. And the reason this isn't so easy to prove is that when you look at this weak almost every, well, wrong color. When you look at this weak, almost everywhere equality, you know that there's a set of measure zero on which this fails. And this set where it fails depends on the functional X star. And as you vary X star over the whole dual space, you can actually get a lot of measure zero sets that accumulate up to a non-measure zero set because there are uncountably many of them. So here's where the issue comes in. But this statement is true, we're gonna prove it. That problem incidentally is why you need the strong measurability assumption because it's gonna let you bring separability into play. It's gonna let you test things on countable sets. And then when you have countable unions of sets of measure zero, you get a set of measure zero. All right, let's do the proof. One of these directions is obvious. Maybe I shouldn't say obvious, I'll say immediate. I don't like saying something is obvious because there's always going to be somebody to whom it's not obvious. Going from the, the almost everywhere equality to the weak almost everywhere equality is pretty much immediate. If F is equal to G, then this scalar value functions, yeah, whatever. Converse is harder. So for all functionals X star, Consider the set, what will I call it? N sub X star. This is the set where F is not equal to G when tested against X star. So this set by assumption has measure zero because we're assuming that for every functional, we, well, for, yeah, this is the assumption for every functional, this set has measure zero. The problem is that if you take the union of all of these sets, maybe is not equal to zero. That's not really a very clear way of writing it. May be positive. Hey, Alex. Yep. Um, is there an obvious example or is it just too tricky? I spent about half an hour thinking about it when I wrote the notes and I couldn't do it. Okay. So let's say it's I not obvious. The, that function I mentioned earlier will also work in this case. I think it might actually, because I didn't, I was, I was, in that half an hour that I thought about it, I was converging upon something that was similar to that. And then I simply ran out of time and I thought, well, if it's taking me half an hour to do it and I'm writing the notes, I probably shouldn't set it as an exercise for the students. And I thought I'd leave it at that. And I thought probably some clever student will point out the example in like one minute. <laughs> and I would be embarrassed if that sort of thing hadn't happened to me so many times before. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it after the lecture, it probably works. Anyway, so the problem is that this union is uncountable. 
it's a un uh, uncountable uh, a union of uncountably many sets. So let's use Pettis. F and G are strongly measurable, so they're separably valued. So there exists a separable subspace X prime of X such that F and G both map into X prime. To be more precise, there's a separable subspace associated with F and another separable subspace associated with G. We take the union of them and the span of that and the closure, if you need to take a closure. That's still gonna be separable and it's gonna contain the ranges of both F and G. We've got finitely many separable subspaces. So of course they generate a separable subspace. Okay, now what do I want to do next? We want to use the separability in a clever way. By separability of X prime, there exists a sequence in particular, a countable sequence. There exists a sequence of functionals in X dual, which separates the points of X prime. What do I mean by separating points of X prime? I mean that if X prime one tested against one of these functionals is equal to X prime two tested against one of these functionals. This is for X one prime, X two prime and X prime. If this is true for all N, so for all functionals in this sequence, then you necessarily have that X one prime equals X two prime. It says that you can test equality in X prime by testing against countably many functionals. Um, I think I have a reference to a proof of this in the appendix of the notes. At least I should have put one there. This is a little hahn barnack exercise using separability. Everything is ultimately a hahn barnack exercise, right? <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll use the sequence of functionals to, to create this, this measure zero set away from which F equals to G. Let's define N to be the union over natural numbers N of the, the null sets associated to these functionals. So now this is a countable union. Rather than an uncountable one. So the measure of N is zero because it's the union of countably many sets of measure zero. And for all S that are not in this set, we have F tested against X N star equals G of S tested against X N star for all N. Because the set where this fails is precisely the union N that we defined earlier. For each N we have this set n sub x n star where it fails we take the union so we're away from all of the sets of failure now since this sequence of functionals separates points of x prime and since we know that f of s and g of s not equals f of s and g of s sorry my writing's a mess today f of s and g of s are both in x prime this is enough to guarantee that f of s equals g of s and this was for all s not in n and n has measure zero so we conclude that f is almost everywhere equal to g and that's what we wanted to show so this is a nice little application of the pettis theorem for strongly measurable well, the characterization of strongly measurable functions as those things that are separably valued plus something else. And then using the separable subspace we extract to write out a, a null set as a countable union of things that we can basically test against. Heuristically, I mean, in one line, this is just use separability to make everything countable. <laughs>
this is pretty much the one thing you do with separability. You make everything reduced to something countable. Of course, the key point in the proof, I guess, is the fact that when you have a separable space, you can find a, a countable sequence in the dual that separates the points, which maybe is not immediately obvious if you're not used to this sort of thing. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So we're going to move on to a new topic. Well, not really too new, but you know, something other than just measurability. Measurability is going to come up over and over again throughout the course, but hopefully this is the, the foundation on which we can build our stuff such that we can sort of ignore all of the measurability questions that come up. It would be tedious if we constantly had to talk about measurability. So the next topic is Bochner spaces. Bochner spaces are the vector valued version of Lebesgue spaces. They're not called Lebesgue spaces because Lebesgue had nothing to do with them. I don't know the, the real history of this field. Like they're called Bochner spaces. Sometimes they're called Bochner Lebesgue spaces. I don't really know whether Bochner was truly the one to invent them. It's usually the case that if something is named after somebody, then they didn't invent it. <laughs> so probably the only thing we can say with certainty is that Bochner didn't invent them. So the way we define these Bochner spaces is basically the same as the way you define Lebesgue spaces. You actually define them in terms of Lebesgue spaces. So if you have a function f, which is x valued, s is still a, a measure space like before. We define this pointwise norm function to write it as norm of f in x. Now this is not a norm of f, it's a function. It maps S to the non-negative reals. And at S, it is just the norm of F of S. It's just a bit of clever notation so that we can say like, take this scalar valued function associated with F, yeah. And we observe that if F is measurable, it's not strongly measurable, it's measurable. If F is measurable, then this norm function is also measurable. The reason for this is that the function that sends a vector towards norm is continuous. So this norm function, norm of f, is a composition of a continuous, uh, a measurable function with a continuous function. So it's measurable, right? In particular, if f is strongly measurable, then of course, the norm of f is also measurable, but you don't need strong measurability for that. Now let's define our Bochner space. I'll quantify over everything. We take a measure space. Sorry, my handwriting is off today. I'm still using this absolutely awful toothpick of a stylus. I have ordered a new one. Take a measure space and a Barnack space. And we take an exponent P, which is between one and infinity, including the endpoints. And we let LP S A mu valued in X. I'm not gonna use all of these letters all of the time. That would be completely annoying. So let LP valued in X denote the set of all strongly measurable functions f into x, of course, such that the norm function, the pointwise norm function is in the scalar valued LP space. That's the probably the simplest possible definition you can make of the Bochner space. Take the norm pointwise and then ask for that to be an LP in the classical sense. And of course we can define a norm. Now this is actually a norm, the norm of F in the Bochner space LP. 
is defined to be the scalar valid LP norm of the norm function, like that. And just to be really explicit, I'll write out what I mean by this. If P is not infinity, this is the integral of the norm of F to the P power to the one on P. Of course, this is for P not equal to infinity. And when P is infinity, we take the essential supremum. Like that. So it's the classic LP norm, but you replace the absolute value by a norm. Simple, it's really the only thing it could be. The only real technicality here is that we demand that the functions are strongly measurable. Keep this in mind, this is sometimes important, easy to forget. Oh, one more thing, we, we identify functions f and g in the LP space, if they're almost everywhere equal. And we do this pretty much freely. And this can lead to technicalities if you pay close enough attention, but all of these technicalities can always be solved. Everything will work. You have to have faith in it. Okay, that's the end of the definition. Uh, I have a few remarks to make about it. Firstly, we'll write LPS or maybe LP mu or maybe even LP of A, the sigma algebra. All of these things are just equal to, to this thing here because if I had to write out all of these letters every time, it would just get really annoying. Sometimes I might even write just LPX. It just depends on what I want to emphasize. Sometimes you want to emphasize a set. Sometimes you want to emphasize a sigma algebra, particularly when you're doing probabilistic things. Sometimes you want to emphasize the measure. Sometimes you don't care. Sometimes you just write LPX, but you never drop X. You always write X here. If X does not appear, it means if I just write LPS, this means LPS valued in the scalar field, which could be R or C. That's just a notation remark. Um, LPX is a Banach space. You have to prove this because showing this is a norm isn't hard, but showing that it's complete, I mean, that's also not hard either. You take the classic proof. You go to your favorite measure theory textbook, you see that the scalar valued LP space is a Banach space, and you notice that the exact same proof works for Bachner spaces. But I think you use the strong measurability for that. I think you actually use that your functions can be seen as pointwise limits of simple functions to prove the completeness. I think maybe I'm wrong about this. You can go and try to prove it. And add one important remark, which is important enough to actually get a heading. There exists functions f that are not strongly measurable, such that the LP norm of the norm function is finite. So this condition that we had for membership of the Bochner space, that the, that the LP norm of the norm function is finite, can be satisfied without F being strongly measurable. Remember I said that for the norm function to be measurable, we only need that F is measurable. So you can make sense of this norm even when F is not strongly measurable. But such an F is not in the Bochner space because one of the conditions for membership in the Bochner space was strong measurability. So just remember this, having this norm being finite, this norm being finite, it's not enough to guarantee membership in LP. I ran into a problem once in a paper because of this. It wasn't a serious one, but it took a little bit of time to fix it. You do need to show your things are strongly measurable. So if there are no questions about Bochner spaces, just the definition or anything like that, then I'll move on. Everyone seems okay. I'll start with the proposition. 
that I'm not going to prove the proofs in the notes. It's just a little bit annoying to write down, particularly on a tablet, particularly when your stylus is a, a toothpick and it's not really a fun proof. So I'm, I'm happy to skip this proof. Um, so with, if you have a measure space and a Barnack space as above, for all P between one and infinity, but not including infinity, the subspace of simple functions. So I'll write out what this is. This is the simple functions valued in X. I don't know if I introduced this notation for simple functions, sigma to the right simple. I did apparently, okay. Simple functions that are also in LP because not every simple function is in LP. You can have infinite measure characteristic functions that are gonna disqualify you from being in LP. The subspace of simple functions is dense in LP. Now the proof of this, which I'm not gonna do, just involves taking a function that's in LP, writing it as a limit, limit of simple functions, truncating those simple functions to guarantee that they're in LP, and then showing that that converges to the original function in LP. You can write out the details of that. There's a little bit of dominated convergence in there. It's in the notes as well. But an important thing here is that this does not work for P equals infinity. Now, if, hang on, do I have time for this result? Yes, I do. I find this really inexplicably interesting somehow. Uh, the simple functions are dense in L infinity. Let's just do the sequence space L infinity. This is true for more general measure spaces. The simple functions are dense in L infinity over the natural numbers if and only if X is finite dimensional. So you might remember for scalar valued functions, the simple functions are dense in L infinity. And you do use this all the time, but this fails for Barnack valued functions. As long as your Barnack space is infinite dimensional, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if it's a Hilbert space. It doesn't matter how nice your Barnack space is. As long as it's infinite dimensional, you're not going to have density of simple functions in L infinity. And this causes all sorts of problems, but it's just a fact of life. This I'll prove because the proof is actually interesting. The if direction, so X being finite dimensional implies density of the simple functions in L infinity. This is a classic proof and I won't do it. But I will say that it uses compactness of closed balls in X. And you only have this when X is finite dimensional. This is pretty familiar for finite dimensional X, like a closed unit ball, for example, that's compact, right? But for infinite dimensional Barnack spaces, this is not true, at least not in the norm topology, not in the usual topology you think of. Now the only if direction, showing that X is finite dimensional if the simple functions are dense, essentially what's happening here is you're proving the compactness of the closed unit ball and thus implying that X is finite dimensional. But let's do the proof. If the dimension of X is infinite, there exists a sequence AN, an infinite sequence of unit vectors in X, such that the distance between two of them is greater than one half if N is not equal to M. You can have a well separated sequence of unit vectors if your space is finite dimensional, you simply don't have the room to do this. But whenever you have an infinite dimensional Barnack space, this can be done. This is usually proven in a basic functional analysis course. I'm not gonna prove it here, but it's a, a nice thing to prove. Let's define a function F valued in X by F of N is the nth element of this sequence. Or we could have just taken F to be A from the beginning, couldn't we? Let's write it like this. Then F is in L infinity, valued in X. Obviously it's bounded because we took a sequence of unit vectors. And I will just note every function from the natural numbers to X is strongly measurable. 
because you only have this countable set that you're working on, you can quite easily recognize every function as a pointwise limit of simple functions. Take the first n and do that for every n. This converges pointwise to your function and these approximants were simple. So every, or you can all say that, okay, every function from n to x is separably valued and weakly measurable. You can use petters if you want. Separably valued because n is countable. So you've got this function f. And let's suppose that the simple functions are dense. If simple functions are dense in L infinity, then there exists a function G. Well, it's not just mapping n to x, it's simple. There exists a simple function G such that the distance from G to F in L infinity is less than one quarter. We don't even need arbitrarily close simple functions here. We just need a function that's within one quarter of this function f. So what happens with this function? Whenever you take n and m that are not equal, let's estimate the distance between a n and a m using the triangle inequality. Now we know that this distance is greater than one half. So we're gonna also show that it's small and get a contradiction somewhere. So you use a triangle inequality. A n is F n, of course. So F n minus G n in X plus G n minus G m in X plus G m minus F n. <coughs> we draw a nice little triangle of some sort between Fn and Fm, that should be m. Yeah. Now we know that f and g are within one quarter of each other. So we can control these two terms here because this distance is in the L infinity norm. So in particular for every n or every m, this distance is less than one quarter. So this is less than or equal to one half plus gn minus gm. Now, what is this telling us? It's telling us that the distance between GN and GM is greater than or equal to AN minus AM minus one half. Now by assumption, we assume that these unit vectors AN and AM are all distance greater than one half from each other. So this distance here is greater than zero. And so what this tells us is that the sequence GN has to be infinite. Well, not the sequence, the set of all points GN, let's say. Of course, the sequence is infinite. Because for every N and M, GN can't be equal to GM. They all have to be far apart from each other. Yeah, so you have to have infinitely many points. This is essentially a pigeonhole argument. But we assume that G was simple. And simple functions have finite ranges. So that's a contradiction. All right. <laughs> G's paradoxical. So all of this is telling us, just to go back to the result, because we can forget where we were, if the simple functions are dense in X valued L infinity over N or over any sufficiently rich measure space, then X is finite dimensional. This will work for any measure space that has infinitely many measurable sets that are pairwise disjoint and of positive measure. Then you can basically place a value on each of these sets and use the disjointness to, to run this argument. I'm gonna put a little box around this proposition because I like it so much. And this is a, this proposition is a real obstruction because a lot of the arguments we'd like to do involve using the fact that simple functions are dense in L infinity. And then these arguments don't work anymore. Also the fact that simple functions aren't dense in L infinity also tells you that you aren't really gonna have many reasonable dense subspaces of L infinity. So you can't work on the Bochner space L infinity by approximation. You kind of have to work on it directly. And this is really annoying, right? I think it's time for a break because it's about 11 and my notes say to take a break here.